first of all, the uh, the title here, the implication is that we're going to have a, a fairly nerdy snooze fest on our hands. And that's, for me, actually, this study is kind of a pivotal, very poignant study that really gets to the, the, the creamy frosting center of our of our collective Twinkie here. It absolutely gets to the heart of what WPD is. Pardon the, the terrible pun. I, I kind of have to. That's my job as a dad to do these things. But our, our goal, obviously, in all of watershed protection is basically the just to keep our streams healthy as that we kind of began to bring ourselves as the watershed doctors and not specifically saying a doctor in specific but the whole kind of medical peripheral that goes around them We've got the spills teams and the field ops are basically on their boots on the ground day in and day out emergency responding and keeping everything flowing we have the uh the education and the prevention team basically kind of like your your general practitioners helping you giving you good advice and trying to get you to eat right and be healthy and then inspectors reviewers they're doing checkups they're doing routine checkups Ups, we're monitoring your health. Basically, it's this this whole large medical analogy because uh, our watershed is our health. If you if you come down to it, if you're talking about health of a of a watershed, you definitely have to talk about it in the framework of a pyramid. Of the foundation, the cradle of this of this pyramid is the hydrology. It's it's the foundation of how the water basically moves through the system. If you've got too much storm scours or too many droughts or something like that, you, you really don't have much much to base your, your water quality in. And then the geomorphology on top of that, you've got the bed load, the sediment transport, the stuff moving through the channels, what kind of physical habitat is there, erosion, whatnot. And then on top of that is the, the water itself. What are the constituents in the water? What are the contaminants, nutrients, bacteria? Can that water then support the life? And then on top, perched right there on top, you do have the biology. It is basically the ultimate response variable. It indicates what can be supported by all the pieces beneath it. I've had developers actually tell me that they want to enhance or they want to mitigate for a wetland by by making the creek better can they just add some fish or add some plants to the creek and that is it shows a fundamental lack in the understanding of a stream the stream is not the biology the stream is is the watershed that has come to that point it is the physical habitat that is underneath it and then it's the the what the stuff that's flowing through the water and the, the biology is just there uh, as a as a result of what is possible so it is the re ultimate response so we look at these ultimate response in our watersheds as as part of our eii program as part of our biological monitoring systems now uh, you know we and I, I say the word we to kind of indicate this current choir that I'm preaching to right now. We understand that development affects ecology. I think your your average person just walking along Waller Creek would see a water and think, oh, there's water, there's a creek, there must be fish and good things. That's lovely. And that they look at another creek and they go, oh, that's also got a bunch of weeds around it. Now, we see two very different things. We see that Waller Creek is is at its core basically just a, a, a channel with water. The watershed itself has over 50% impervious cover, where half the watershed is just man-made impervious cover. Other watersheds, the headwaters to Onion, Bull, Barton, Walnut, the nice big creeks, these have much less impervious cover. And as a result, the area around them has a higher biological productivity and diversity, and the stream bed itself is much more productive and alive and diverse, and it can support all the different kind of fish and the bugs that, that we'd want it to. You know, over time, even through the 80s and 90s, when when the city of Austin started to create their regulations, they've, they've mapped out these different regulatory zones, like the Barton Spring Zone, Water Supply Zones, Edwards Aquifer, Recharge, stuff like that. You've, you, you identify these areas, and then we put restrictions on how much impervious cover you can have in them. Obviously, the urban core, it's too late. That's just developed over time to have too much of a, an impervious cover. So, those urban areas are allowed to have a lot of impervious cover. The, the trick here is just finding what is the right percent impervious cover that you don't have degradation. I mean, obviously, 4% impervious cover is pretty great. You can see all the examples of that. And you'd see 50% impervious cover is pretty terrible. But where in there should we be setting those thresholds, those limitations? Where do the ecological effects begin? At, at what point of development, I use IC, I'll say IC a lot, that's impervious cover. At what point does that begin to affect aquatic life? What percentage is okay? And, and not just impervious cover as a kind of a surrogate for all things human induced, but what concentration specifically of nutrients? If someone is applying for a wastewater discharge permit, from the county, from the state, at, at, at what concentration will it affect the community? Where exactly, 
specifically, precisely, where is that threshold? Because over time, TCQ and others just said, oh, two milligrams per liter, you know, that's okay. Well, I don't know that there's that many studies that really drill down into the very specific resolution that we've done here. I, I really feel like this is kind of groundbreaking stuff. We have the data now. We, we didn't have it at first. And wh when Chris was still here, Chris was a big proponent for pushing this thing called Objective Zero. So Objective Zero, it was basically where do we want to go? What is our goal? What what is what is what would we like our city to be like if it if it weren't for all these stressors? Things could be the best they could be. Let's let's make that our goal and let's try to have controls and rules that would would get us there. For example, in the medical analogy, your cholesterol level. For the longest time, cholesterol levels they really didn't know exactly what they do. They knew if you had high cholesterol, you were probably going to have problems. Well, they know a lot more now about your LDL and your HDL and your triglycerides. There that we get this increasing resolution of what are those thresholds and where. Are you more likely to fail as a as a as a human? Your body mass index, your blood pressure. There's all these different ways you can look at these things um, to tell when your health is affected. In that same respect, where there's different ways to look at that health, gauge that health, and uh, evaluate it, we've got the life in the streams. You could look at the fish, you could look at the algae, you could look at the bugs, you could look at the diatoms. In our case, we have we look at two different lines of evidence: the diatoms and the benthic, benthic macroinvertebrates. Diatoms are single cellular algae. They make themselves little cases, little two halved cases out of silica. You can prepare them. You take a sample of them, scrape them off the rocks. They're a part of the community called the paraphyton. They like growing on top of the rocks. Some of them are modal. Others like to stick onto the rocks. But you can take those and put them under a microscope after you prepare them. And the little silica cases will tell you exactly which genera they are, and which species they are. And you can use that community, that diverse community, the same way you look at benthic macroinvertebrates. Some of those organisms, the very large yellow one down the bottom is a stonefly. Stoneflies really only like cold, clear water with low turbidity, high oxygen, low nutrients. Other creatures, clams and snails and whatnot, they really don't care too much. They can pretty much live anywhere. The subtle difference between these two communities is all Although they're basically t they can basically tell you the same thing is that the diatoms react fairly quickly they're they're algae and so they can grow really fast and their response is kind of in the matter of days weeks maybe maybe a month or so of what conditions what antecedent conditions have allowed certain species to live there the benthic macroinvertebrates on the other hand are, are nice because these guys they are born as eggs they grow through their nymph stages they do their either incomplete or complete metamorphosis but that might be on the order of months and sometimes years that large dragonfly to the left of that stonefly on the bottom, bottom left, that's a, an Eshenid dragonfly. That thing has lived probably in that stream for two or three years, maybe. The data we've got is extremely powerful now. After three decades of collecting data, you know, we have somewhere on the order of 60 sites every year, about, um, you might have 20 taxa at, at a site for every, you know, maybe sometimes 30, sometimes just 10. And maybe you might have between, you know, 200 to 1,000, maybe, you know, let's say an average of 350 uh, individual bugs that you collect per sample. That translates to 1,800 sample events with about 36,000 taxa incidences and over 12 million individual records of, of, of individual bugs at a site. I mean, that is, is a very large data set. I, I do not want to undersell how big that data set is. And then we take that in, in concert with the water chemistry results, the nutrients, the turbidity, the, the sediment, the conductivity, all these, the pH, DO, and we can start to synthesize some pretty great conclusions with some fairly high statistical significance. So uh, we took a fairly ambitious objective and said, okay, let's take these two community assemblages and let's put them in the context of the stressors. And in this case, stressors I've listed down at the bottom, we're going to look at impervious cover as just kind of being that surrogate for all things human imposed. And then flow permanence, which obviously, you know, if you've got a, a creek that's ephemeral or a creek that floods that, you either got a hydrograph that's peaky like the urban core, or maybe you have long sustained spring flow at some headwaters, that very much affects the biological community, except we don't have a whole lot of influence on that. And then total phosphorus and total nitrogen, these are your two classic nutrients that you find in things like waste, human waste, animal waste, even decaying plant matter, plant waste, uh, and waste water, obviously, whether it's treated or untreated. And then specific conductance. Specific conductance is in and of itself, it's just the ability for the water to conduct electricity because of the dissolved constituents in it. But when you have something like wastewater and lots of human influence and oil and petroleum things off the uh, salts for another big one, if you have salts that you put on the roads and, and your house, these things all of a sudden start to carry conductivity. So more stuff in the water is that specific conductance. So how much is too much? Where is that inflection point? You know, what milligrams per liter is okay for nitrogen. What are our goals? This now kind of leads us to our partnership with Ryan King. He is a pioneer 
of a method called the Threshold Indicator Tax Analysis, Titan. From here on out, I'm just going to call it Titan. And what it does is it really looks at taxa specific. Now, I use the word taxa over and over again. Taxa is a, that means a type of bug, not necessarily a species. It may be the genus level, or it may be the family level, but it is a discrete type of benthic macroinvertebrate or a discrete type of a diatom. So it identifies taxa specific and community level, like the assemblage, all the different bugs at a site, change in frequency and abundance. So how often something does or does not occur at a given site, maybe it occurred at a given site for a while and doesn't occur there anymore, or it occurs frequently in the upper watershed, but not the lower watershed. And then the abundance, the relative abundance of that individual. The general idea here is that some taxa respond negatively to a stressor. If you put more and more nutrients into a stream, some creatures are going to be intolerant. They decrease in their prevalence. Maybe it's they, they started off uh, as a, a robust community with lots of them, and the more and more nutrients you put in, there's less and less of them. And at some point, they just can't live there anymore, and you don't find them in these waterways that have too much nutrients. This is an example that's an American ruby spot. We're calling a ruby. This tax ruby, she is a decreaser, which means that her frequency of occurrence decreases with increasing stressor. So on the, on the uh, I'm going to show some, this is a, a facet of a complex set of slides I'm going to show. So I'm just kind of working my way up to a, a big graph here. When you see the x-axis on the bottom, the left side is going to be the low stress. So either a low nutrient, in this case, low impervious cover. On the right side is going to be more and more. Now, we don't have any sites with 100% impervious cover, you know, 50 as urban as it gets already. So in this case, just this, in this fictional example, there is a change. Somewhere around 25% impervious cover, you see a strength of response. And in a decrease, so that means you don't find her anymore. She either starts reducing her prevalence at those sites, and then after that, she drops off entirely, and you don't see that individual anymore. She has reduced her frequency of occurrence. She is a decreaser. Those are going to be in kind of a gray or a blue, while other species actually kind of increase with an increased stressor. We're just going to call them increasers. Imagine these to be kind of like your rats and your roaches of the, of the animal world. If you have a really disgusting, horrible habitat, the rats and the roaches might be just fine. You'll see them everywhere, no problem. On the other hand, if, if you won't see any like, uh, you know, ocelots and osprey, if you, if you see lots of ocelots and osprey, you know you've got really good, robust, high integrity habitat. So the ocelots and osprey are going to be the decreasers. They go away with an increasing stress. And the rats and the roaches are going to be the increasers. They increase with increasing stress. So I'm putting this, these two groups together. Remember the gray, blue are going to be my decreasers and uh, the kind of pink reds are going to be the increasers. Now, the darker the color, you see those little Z score bars in the middle, the darker the color indicates the strength of that response. So if the color is really dark, that means at a given stress level, that creature completely lost it. They, they just stopped showing up at that site at all. Or they, they lost their abundance. They had a, some very uh, strong change to that stressor. So in this case, I've got taxa A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Some of them are increasers. Some of them are decreasers. You can see at what level of stress the community changed or they just they began to stop showing up, or maybe they started increasing as the increasers went. We have lots and lots, hundreds, I think, of, of individual taxa here of both bugs and, and diatoms. We're only going to show you the ones that responded in a statistically significant way. So here is a typical graph from the Titan analysis. And we're going to use the stressor, in this case, impervious cover. And we're just looking at the benthic macroinvertebrates. We're just looking at the bugs right now. On your top part of the graph, you see all of these decreasers. They're very top. Let's look at the very top. Travarella, Enthrolodes, Isonychia, Helisoma. These are all mostly the mayflies and the, and the caddisflies except for helosoma, helosoma is a snail. Those creatures right around the 0.1, now that's a decimal, so what I'm talking about there is about 10%, 0.1 is 10%. So even before that 0.1, somewhere around 5% to 8%, you see to see these decreasers having a response. And all of a sudden, they're there, for, uh, they're there in, in the low impervious cover watersheds. You start to get a little more impervious cover. You just don't see them too much after that. And then you see this another kind of this cohort of, inc of decreasers all clustered together, somewhere in the middle between Barosis, Anopheles, Myotrichia, Leuctrochia. There's a cluster there in that middle right around 0.2, maybe somewhere between 15 to 25 percent. You have a large aggregate, aggregated, aggregated loss of these sensitive organisms. And on the flip side, down at the bottom, you do see that somewhere around those same kind of areas, 
around that that 10 percent and then again around that uh 25 to 50 percent you start to see changes in the community in this case those changes will be increasing of the rats and the roaches this right here this one slide already just kind of makes me giddy because it's what it's telling me in a very significant way of what is degradation what is happening what changes the community on a taxa level when you have some type of stressor and that's something that we've all known as a generality but to be this specific to our setting and our region and our species and our stressors it's, it's just a wonderful thing i can't get over it so this is the same type of graph in the diatoms and in this case they're basically telling you the exact same thing somewhere between that five to eight percent you'll see the initial response to a bunch of very sensitive organisms that just start falling off the map. Then you have another big clump right around that point too. So between 15 to 25% of point pervious cover, you see a huge crash of these sensitive species. And at that same point, as you get more and more stress, you start to see some of these increases, the taller species coming back up again. This right here alone, I could just draw circles around cohorts, around groups of things and say, okay, folks, Let's do our let's redo our impervious cover limitations because now we know what ecology response there is to specific percentages of impervious cover. Very exciting. Total phosphorus that's our one of our limiting nutrients. Uh, whenever I say limiting nutrients, that's like if you're building peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, you need peanut butter, you need jelly, and you need bread. Well, if you have a crate of peanut butter and a crate of jelly, but you only have one loaf of bread, you're you're only going to make a couple of sandwiches. Phosphorus is the bread. So if you have a lot of phosphorus, then you can make peanut butter sandwich, jelly sandwiches all day long. So that phosphorus kind of limits all the things that can happen with eutrophication. In our case, though, we take a look at this and look how many sensitive creatures respond right around 0 0.01, 0 0.01 milligrams per liter. You start to put that much phosphorus in a system, and that is a tiny amount. That is basically the detection limit of, of the equipment, the laboratory equipment can actually pick up but you start putting that in there and all of a sudden your sensitive species start crashing in a very in a very large way and maybe all the way up to point maybe 0 0.01 0 0.02 you see that almost this total loss by 0 0.03 this total loss so sensitive species now this implies to me though that since our detection limit is 0 0.01 that we actually probably have a much lower threshold for for phosphorus in our systems we can only just uh, detect 0.01 because that's what our tools conduct. Brent actually has done been part of some studies that indicate that it is definitely lower, probably more on the 0.05 or something like that. Po sorry, 0 0.005. Total phosphorus and diatoms shows you the same thing. Around 0.01, you see major changes already. So a, even a tiny bit of phosphorus can have disastrous effects for the biological community. Total nitrogen, another facet, another nutrient, does the same thing. In this case, somewhere around 0.5 to 1.0 milligrams per liter. That's not a lot of nitrogen either. A lot of criteria are set at two milligrams per liter and higher. So our study is showing you that impacts of degradation to the biological community happens at a much lower level than current limits are, are allowing. Same thing with diatoms. I love having these two lines of evidence from two very different groups doing two very different things, pointing to the exact same thresholds. It, uh, you, normally your science results just don't turn out this clean. There's another set of graphs here I'm going to show and I'll be winding this up pretty quickly for some for some questions and i'm going to kind of wax over this one pretty quickly again the kind of the blue gray are the decreasers and the pinks are the increasers that top bar is just showing you a line of the confidence intervals with the little dots being kind of where the means are and uh the stressor along along the bottom basically same deal here so if you aggregate all of these community assemblages so you're not just looking at a single tax anymore you're looking at an entire community and you do these things called bootstrap replicates. And I am not a math magician, so I don't entirely understand this, but it means it, it basically they take that model and they run that model over and over and over again. And it comes out to have within those confidence intervals, it shows you very specifically that you'll have the increasers go up as a community and you might have multiple peaks due to the kind of uh, the static in the data and your increasers increase. Here's an example for impervious cover, bugs on the left, diatoms on the right. And I'm going to pretty limit my discussion to the bottom graphs, those kind of interpolated lines on the bottom. Notice on impervious cover on the bugs, bottom left, the intolerant species, we call them the decreasers. Those things start showing big responses very rapidly to little changes in impervious cover. And then it kind of plateaus over the curve, meaning, you know, once you've gotten to that, you know, 10% or 20% impervious cover, 
you've got these things beaten down already. And there's some others that are that are showing a response, but then they just crash entirely at 0.6. So anything above 0.6, 60% impervious cover, you got Waller Creek. You just got you've got rats and roaches. Impervious cover on the bottom, same thing. You've got the inc- the increasers, the the pink ones. These are your what I call the rats and the roaches. You'll notice that they have more subtle change because they can survive pretty much everywhere. But even at some level, they start they start going away too. The uh, graphs are more overlined the, the, for the diatoms, showing the increases and decreases, showing the same thing. But I would look at that bottom right graph and I would say, you know what? There is a significant demonstrable obvious and compelling change to the community, a degradation of a biological community, somewhere around that 0.8, so maybe 8% impervious cover, all the way up 10% impervious cover. That is huge. You've got a very large response. And after that, things just start falling apart. Same thing for total phosphorus, but the graph looks a little different. In this case, your diatoms, remember diatoms are basically algae, so they like phosphorus. So the more of them, the more phosphorus you give them, many of those diatoms increase rapidly and they just can't get enough. They're eating sandwiches all day long. The uh, sensitive species though show that same decline. And the sensitive species basically between somewhere up to that very, very lowest level of concentration of milligrams per liter of phosphorus, there is a large change in those sensitive species. And then they just slowly start to go away until you reach that 0.1 to 0.2. Remember earlier I said 0.1 or 0.2 is is where a lot of regulations are. So the way I see it, the regulations written right now already are far too degradational. Nitrogen, basically the same thing. It's got a very different response, and that's because of the of the way the organisms, the the plants, the algae, and the plants use nitrogen, phosphorus. So I'm going to speed up ahead to the the punchline here. Impervious cover are both the diatoms and the bugs show declines at less than 5% impervious cover. And I don't know if you know what impervious cover is in your own personal property. I've got a fairly a lot of elbow in my house and I'm still 10% impervious cover. So even what I consider myself to be a good steward, I'm already past the level that that I know that creeks are experiencing degradation. So that for this, I would need to have my rain garden. I would need to have other measures that limit or offset those influences. And then somewhere around 8%. And then, but once the time you get to 30% impervious cover for macroinvertebrates and maybe 20% in cover, percent of recovery for diatoms, you've got some large aggregate degradation. So we, we know those, that's too far. And if we're going to set our sights on having swimmable, high integrity streams, we need to set our sights on a lot less impervious cover and impacts than we have now, or at least to find ways to offset that. I'm going to skip overflow permanence and go back to it. The two nutrients, total phosphorus and total nitrogen, you do see uh, sharp declines at basically the the current detection limit for phosphorus. So little tiny amounts of nutrients make big differences. So any wastewater stream, any wastewater in the stream, any fertilizers in the stream have huge ramifications to that stream. Specific conductance, again, that kind of like large aggregated indicator shows that anywhere above six to 700, you start to see some changes. And then flow permanence, I'll go back to that one. Obviously, flow permanence is something we can sort of control using our our structural controls, but not very well. If you have water in the creek all the time, that's the best thing for the bugs. Although some of our species are adapted to going dry, so that's okay every now and then. Oh, and this is just a gratuitous video I took just recently of a, of a beautiful mayfly called Hexagenia. It's a burrowing mayfly. Uh, this thing has enormous gills on the back of it, beautiful f- kind of look, uh, flowing, waving grasses. And just as the name would apply, it burrows. So it's got two tusks that it used to burrow, arms that it used to burrow. It goes under the sediment, even with these very delicate, beautiful little feathery things. And the reason why I show this to you is because sediment is like a little magnet. Little clay particles are, are charged. There's a positive negative side. And they like to grab things like pesticides, herbicides, nutrients, sticks to sediment. So this guy burrowing down in the sediment has to very intimately deal with the pollutants that are in that sediment. This, by the way, is Little Bear Creek, kind of one of our cleanest creeks. That's all the time that I'm going to blab, and I left at least two minutes for other people to talk. Thank you for that presentation, Andrew. They're always informative and entertaining. Um, I have to say, I didn't think that Twinkies were going to manage to work their way into conversation today, but (laughs) (laughs) well done. So we do have a few questions. One is, are the impervious cover amounts an average value across the entire watershed or within a certain distance of the creek? That's a fantastic question. Who said, who, who did that one? Who was that? <laughs> That's from Christina, Gold Star. 
Out, yes, double gold stars. So uh, the impervious cover for a given site that we went to is the impervious cover of the watershed, the catchment area above it. So we were able to do site-specific impervious covers for that watershed. However, what I'm finding, at least with our trash study, and I think with other things, is that the area more closely around it, and I don't know how close that is, but the area more closely around it obviously impacts that site more. And as you get to a very large watershed, like the bottom of onion, you know, how much impervious cover in the headwaters matters. Each one of these is kind of like a little paper cut. And so it, it definitely influences the stream for a given storm event. But specifically to answer your question, for each site, for each community, for each uh, physical, uh, sorry, uh, ge uh, chemical uh, nutrient, you know, whatever the parameter is, we do the impervious cover for the entire catchment upstream of it, of its part of a watershed. Good question. So I'm going to throw in one for myself. As you were talking about Waller Creek, you were talking about uh, the rats and roaches. And because, as we know, that's a heavily, heavily urban, urbanized area in the urban core, as it is being redeveloped and as we've been involved in conversations about rock sizes and plant communities, um, is there hope for being able to shift what that graph looks like for a creek? Do I have hope or is there hope, period? I think this <laughs> I guess is it too too early? Is that something we're gonna be monitoring for? That that is a very tall order, you know, and of course we're monitoring for it. We monitor uh the, the bottom, the middle, the sub-middle, and then the top of, of Waller every year. And I think what I would say optimistically is that our data over time is showing that um as we've, uh, you know, there is there is obviously this kind of decrease in degradation in some streams, and some streams are flat, and some streams appear to be getting maybe a little bit better. But the fact that they're all not crashing with this crazy population and all the stuff that's happening, I think, is already an indication that the things that we are doing, stormwater controls, education and outreach, monitoring, uh, uh, invest, uh, like site investigation, spills team, all of these cumulative efforts that we are doing is absolutely having effect. Um, is it enough of an effect that we can pull something back out of the, the maw of, of, of degradation? Um, sure. Why not? Let's, uh, let's all be optimistic that, but that ultimately that is the, that is the purpose of objective zero is to identify where do we want to go and then how do we get there? And if we can't blow up all the impervious cover and plant trees, what things can we do to, to help minimize that? So yeah, there's, there's hope. There's hope. Yeah. There's the it's more still hope. the message that yeah. prevention is the best medicine. <laughs> yes, absolutely. There's hope. Yes. Mateo. Um, yeah, I just wanted to chime in on that one because it's something I worry about all the time. And and the, I think the key to that is not necessarily is there hope. It's like, what do we want? And I think defining we as a city or we even as a, a, an individual watershed community or just uh, ourselves we have to define what success looks like in our creeks. Do we want them to look like all look like Barton Creek? Well, we might not ever get there. Do we want them all to sustain some kind of relatively equal level of, of biological diversity? Or do we want them to be swimmable and fishable? These are really critical questions that we all need to grapple with. I think uh, the strategic plan is doing a really good job of trying to get at this in the past. We set a standard of making these all our creeks function as if there was no development. And I think ultimately that is not feasible in the sense that not only could we not mitigate all the development that's occurred, but there's been it's developed for so long. We've so dramatically changed the way that water and, and soil and plants are in and, and exist in this watershed that there's just no way you can recreate something that's been that changed. But there is a huge amount of potential for us to drive it in a direction, like Andrew said, that would actually be more um, kind of make us happier, hopefully. Excellent points. Um, I'm going to pull in a question from the previous time this presentation was given. So how much do water quality ponds help to fix the negative effects of impervious cover? I'm going to, I would, I'd like Mateo to answer that one because he's already had uh, practice at it once. The answer that I said last time is yes, they do help. They don't mitigate everything. Um, uh, Dad's uh, Bells and, and his group of modelers have been doing a lot of work to try to understand 
what specifically our data tells us that these structures actually do. And there's actually quite a bit of variability. Water quality pond can be one of many different things. There's a lot of different forms and functions of them. Some of the early ones were just basically a, a sand filter. Um, um, some of the more modern versions of these include soil and plants in them. Basically, they all work to mitigate different stressors. Um, some of them are better for hydrology, kind of mimicking pre-development hydrology. Some of them are better for pulling out uh, just particles, solids out of the water, suspended solids. And some of them actually can treat nutrients, some. But I would say that nutrients and bacteria, we don't have any structures in our criteria manual now that seem to do a really good job of managing those. Although uh, when you add soil and plants, you get better data from those. So I would say, yes, they do good work. They do achieve certain levels of, of mitigation, but they're not recreating pre-development conditions. I'm going to I'm going to add to that. I'm going to pull that back to the the functional pyramid part. That uh, those stormwater controls, the, the the water quality volume that they're treating is typically that first tenth of an inch, maybe that first two tenths of an inch. They call that the first flush. So the dirtiest water that you know, if you see a sprinkle on a road over in there, the gutter, it's black with all the brake dust and all the petroleum and all that stuff. So that first flush, which then is also hot, it's hot water which has low DO. That is incredibly terrible for the. It's a slap in the face to the to the the the, the creek stuff. So those water quality ponds are grabbing that first flush, and that is very important. Um, once you have a large storm event and the, the water's kind of overwhelmed and, you know, it, it's pretty much chaos at that point anyway. But I would say that the water quality ponds grabbing that first flush, which is what they're mostly designed to do, is huge. So that's just a uh, look at the Baxter Functional Pyramid. That is that second level from the top. That's that chemistry part, right? It doesn't really do the next part, which is the erosion and sedimentation going through the load, nor does it really address that hydrology. So it is addressing something that helps biology, but not really that underlying foundation that, that makes everything run smoothly. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, another question that came in with the previous presentation was, do we have an example of 0% impervious cover, or that gold standard pre-development a space that we can look to um you know it, it's all that's all about scale right i mean if you, if you look at a bird's nest that's zero percent impervious cover you start widening your scale then you may maybe you get a a, a two rut road where someone has just kind of driven well that compacts the soil compact the soil starts counting as impervious cover so no we don't really have any sites that have zero percent impervious cover but at the same time you know, the sun doesn't rise and set on impervious cover to to judge impacts to a a creek. It's what you're putting on the land and how the water's running over the land too. So, no, we don't have any zero percent, but um, we have a lot of watersheds, Little Bear, Little Bee, uh, the tops of Barton, the top of Bull Creek that are very very low in impervious cover. You know, maybe like only five percent, two percent, three percent impervious cover. So we get close enough to know that those areas with that low of impervious cover. In my opinion, that's the gold standard. We're, we're humans. We have to live somewhere. We have to impact somehow. But if we can keep those impacts low, we might be able to preserve the integrity of the creeks. Yeah, and a great comment came in in the chat saying some of the sites on preserves have extremely low impervious cover upstream of them as True. well. Um, something that's been answered in the chat, but for people who are watching the recording is, could you give examples again of materials or products or environmental processes that introduce phosphorus and nitrogen into creeks? I, I, I listened to that last time and it's, uh, the big ones, right? The big ones, nutrients, fertilizers, people have put fertilizer, weed and feed and stuff on their, their creeks all the time. Uh, so that's a very large source of when it rains, it carries off. Um, something that's a little closer to the creek then is going to be waste, not just human waste, uh, direct human waste input, direct animal waste inputs, um, any decaying organic matter for that matter uh, to a large degree. And then uh, wastewater. I think wastewater is probably the largest, the, the one that's basically deafening if you're talking about impacts to creek, the, the, the one that needs to be addressed uh, with most expeditiousness is going to be wastewater leaks, uh, whether it's treat and, and treated wastewater for that matter is really high. So those are the big ones. Um, if anybody else, uh, every, every, you know, yes, the, the atmosphere has nitrogen inputs and, and there's other things, uh, when you have charcoal and you burn it and you've got ashes, that's some phosphorus in there, but these are all little tiny things compared to the amount of stuff that you see in like the old school detergents and wastewater and fertilizers. Yeah. And what you have when you have just, just so many, people accumulated in one one spot. 
<laughs> oh, quick shout out to Todd, who's out in the field right now, collecting this very kind of data. We've been doing our, our, our EII. And thank you very, very, very much to all the people that have been uh, volunteering to help with this. It's a it's a long effort. It's 60 sites. Uh, we can only do a couple today, and it's hot outside, and it's uh, mosquitoes, stuff like that. So big thanks to all of you who have been helping us with that data collection for this year. We're almost done. We should be done by next week. Thank you, and kudos. The fact that there is 30 years of this data to be able to look at is just mind blowing and something that I think the city should be really proud of it. Um, another great question in the chat. Is this work going to be published in a national journal? I was just about to say that very <laughs> same thing that the fact that we I mean, I don't know of anybody else in our entire region. And I'm talking about the region, you know, the South um, has this long of a data set at the same number of sites uh, in, in this the, this level of intensity. I, I, I don't know that it exists around, he, around here. Other, other uh, places just don't have that sustained interest or funding. You know, we're, uh, the management is usually goldfish about that kind of things, but we've had that. And, we've, and yes, yes, it's going to be published. Uh, Ryan King is going to publish his, and I think we're going to publish ours in a greater context uh, of, this, of the city, and it is going to be out there. And I know that we, I want to push this information toward TCQ and say, look, guys, now you have actual thresholds. You really should start thinking about using them. And, and uh, in the regional and maybe even uh, nationwide, I think this is going to get some attention. Well, I'm glad that we have so many people in the department that have stuck with it and carried that institutional knowledge and passion and pass it on to all of our new team members, too. Um, thank you to everybody for joining us today as we do that information sharing and build on the excitement. I do want to do a big plug for Rain to River, our strategic plan. So the website's raindriveratx.com. And we launched public community engagement with that just last month. So there's a fantastic survey and map where people can show problems, but also places that they love around town and offer solutions and ideas of what they want to see more of or less of. And um, I think it's really wonderful that we have a way where we can have that collective wisdom to then help us envision and protect and create the Austin that we want to. So thanks again, Andrew and Mateo and everybody who contributes um, long sweaty days in the field to getting all of this data. <laughs> have a great afternoon. Thank you.